Dr. Babi Nair and to everyone else who's joined us this morning. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a context, we've been doing this uh, these workshops as a way of like, uh, you could say making a, making a conversation between established scholars, experts in the field and with upcoming ones, you know, as a way of telling them these are unexplored areas which you can do work on. So that's why flying research guides. And it's, it's like, because otherwise, I, I really believe that you do need to do a lot of research even to determine what you need to do research on. And very often that's not understood. People believe that, you know, like finding a research topic or an area or a question is like putting a rabbit out of a hat, you know, sort of thing. So this is meant to be that kind of an exercise. More, I mean, even in established areas, there are, there are you know, a whole range of issues which people have not looked at and where work needs to be done because uh, a PhD thesis is meant to make an original contribution. So it kind of helps if you get pointers and direction that if you look this way or you do it in this manner, this is something which is really required in the field. And it's in that spirit that uh, we felt that if we want to do human rights, we couldn't think of anyone better than you. And considering you've kind of like been, you know, driving the whole field for such a long time, doing it also, especially for South Asia, and uh, also know the, you know the kind of disillusionment which has set in, that what is the kind of work which needs to be still done in human rights and possibly the direct, because see, lots of people opt for the field, but somehow the other, the sort of stuff we very often get is very banal and predicted. Uh, so, you know, predictable. So it would be good like if we, get some kind of uh, pointers to that this would be worthwhile work to do. Yeah. So very, very warm welcome, uh, uh, Professor Nair. And the way in which we'll carry on is basically this, that you speak for about, you know, up to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, yeah. after which we take a kind of a 10 minutes break to get people to ponder on what you have said. Yeah. And then they kind of, you know, like type in their questions. And my colleague, uh, Professor Vasanthi, She's moderating every session, so she will moderate, which means that you know, she'll look at the questions and give it to you in clusters rather than you having to both keep track of the chat as well as to answer. So, and at the very end, we, we kind of give a, maybe a 10 minute sort of an open house where people can switch on their mics and ask questions directly. Sure, sure, sure. So, over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very grateful for this invitation and uh, I'm quite happy to engage with uh, senior people in law who hope to do intensive research on a particular subject related to human rights law or international human humanitarian law. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, there are a lot of students who do opt for human rights. But uh, for lack of direction in certain universities, uh, they are unable to take uh, forward their quest because uh, of what human and material resources are available in that particular university. I know this for a fact because I have a large number of interns from different universities in India uh and have been having them since 1993 so that's quite enough experience under the belt to understand what some of the needs are uh, i think the main challenge for academia is to relate the uh, human rights research that they do to the felt needs on the ground and uh, the felt needs on the ground come from intensive engagement uh, with people working on the ground and uh, I will talk both about the domestic issues that need to be explored as well as the international uh, human rights issues to which India relates 
and which need to be also explored further. The biggest challenge in India in the area of human rights is compliance. And uh, compliance with national law, compliance with international law. And uh, the average activist is quite happy to man the barricades, go to jail, uh, do everything that is necessary to bring an issue on the front burner, but lacks the necessary wherewithal in most cases to put together a proper document that can be circulated uh, uh, nationally and internationally to the legal community, uh, to the academic community to get greater traction. And uh, that is also because I think uh, most universities in India uh, do not have clinical work. And uh, unless from uh, the outset that synergy is created, uh, it's, it becomes a little more difficult to uh, put it on subsequently. Uh, now, for example, I would see the most major problem that faces uh, human rights community in India as I said, is compliance with uh, national law. But one important component of it, uh, which is basically the question of impunity, uh, of lack of accountability uh, by the state and its apparatus. There is no other country in the world which has the equivalent of the official immunity clauses that we have. Uh, Bangladesh, of course, copied it from us. So we have, they have it too. In the past, uh, Mexico had it uh, when they were ruled by a part, uh, political party which was uh, horror of or horrors named as the institutional revolutionary party as if a party could be uh, institutionally revolutionary but uh, no other country has that i'm not talking about sovereign immunity there too our uh, concept of it is a little too drastic and not available in any other english uh, common law country or in the european system now, the issue is, let me come to common law, uh, to, to the official immunity first. There are any number of cases across India where, in spite of the uh, evidence available to launch prosecution against a particular official perpetrator, it is not possible to go forward because you need prior sanction from the state. In cases which do not affect the majesty of the state or the core security as the state perceives it, sometimes official sanction is forthcoming. But Otherwise, in most cases, official sanction is not available. And after you put in your application to the superior court, uh, you find that, uh, or the lower court, you find that you are just waiting, waiting, waiting in an un uh, interminable waiting for Goro syndrome. You just are waiting. And uh, the latest example of it was the very good judgment uh, done by Justice Madan Lokur in the uh, Everfarm case, the extrajudicial executions case of Manipur, where 
he ordered a CBI inquiry into the uh, number of extrajudicial executions that uh, took place uh, in Manipur over a period of time. He ordered a CBI inquiry. The CBI inquiry uh, attested to the veracity of the facts mentioned in the petition. And yet today, uh, we are yet to see prosecutions. The state government of Manipur has acknowledged some of the extrajudicial executions. But the uh, Assam Rifles, which is a central armed police force, one of the CAPFs, has refused to uh, cooperate with the investigation or the further legal process. What do you do in that situation? Uh, now, this is very common in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, where even after the High Court orders one way or the other in habeas corpus matters, the state is unwilling or in some cases unable to uh, comply because the army puts a red flag on the subject. So the army is, in Kashmir especially, is above the law, is above even the ministry trying to direct it to comply uh, or do anything. And this is uh, where I think some of you or one of you or two of you may think of this as a topic to look at the applications in a particular state, uh, Manipur or Kashmir or even Uttar Pradesh uh, and see the number of applications for prosecution of perpetrators. Now malicious prosecution is available. Because most people, after having gone through a 20-year-old uh, uh, trial, got acquitted, do not have the strength to then launch malicious prosecution. The Akshardham case was an exception, where after 20 years, all the individuals were acquitted in uh, uh, the Supreme Court came hard down on the Gujarat police and uh, nothing further happened. The court, while letting them off, while finding that torture had taken place, while finding that uh, evidence was manufactured, while finding that uh, uh, false evidence was given on oath by senior police and other government officials, yet did not order action against any one of them. Uh, how do we deal with this? The Akshardham individuals uh, who were acquitted, uh, unlike most others, actually came to the Supreme Court asking for compensation. They didn't ask for prosecution of the perpetrators who did terrible things to them. Uh, the Supreme Court turned them down. There is a peace of mind on this in the economic and political weekly some time ago during the period of when their, when their order was, uh, when their application was uh, turned down. So compliance, how does how does how do you give the ordinary citizen a stake in the system, a faith in the system? When you don't comply with superior court orders or even court orders of lower courts, then uh, at every point of negation you diminish the rule of law. And this does not seem to ring a bell 
in the powers that be, whether it be now with the present dispensation or with earlier dispensations. I make no allowance for the shade of government in the past or present. They, they're all birds of the same feather as far as these issues are concerned except that it has become much more rampant presently uh, which is unfortunate so you look at this as a possible issue look at a particular state look at the applications look at how the courts have dealt with it in the first instance subsequently look at the how the state government has dealt with it and in the case of the home ministry or Defense Ministry having to give sanctions uh, if they belong to the Central Armed Police Forces or the Army. Look at how the central government has dealt with this issue. There has been very episodic case by case uh, research on this, basically by uh, human rights activists. This needs to be fleshed out by serious academics much, much more than it is presently done. Allied with this is the issue of mandatory compensation for victims of human rights violations. Uh, India has formally done a reservation, what India calls euphemistically declaration on the right to compensation when it's signed the UN Convention on Civil and Political Rights. So there's no mandatory right to compensation as there is in the United States or UK when you, if you have wrongfully uh, imprisoned somebody, uh, then the state must pay. Uh, and it must not pay only for the confinement, but for all the moral stress, the community uh, opprobrium that he or she attracted and a range of other factors which is there in uh, the legislation relating to competition. We have none of that. You can be in prison at, for 20 years and there's any number of cases I can give you. Released for want of evidence by a court law at the end of 20 years and uh, just told okay go home and you're given third class or what is called second class train fare by the jail you're given a jail warrant and thank you very much goodbye uh, this is diff very difficult you've destroyed an individual's life and the state and its officers are not to call into a call to account. The only recent case where the state has been made to pay uh, is the Nambi Narayanan case. Uh, but that's quite controversial. The last word has not been ignored. And so I shan't, that is an exception case. But the, 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 the norm is compensation is not given. In spite of certain high courts, uh, trying to push the envelope further, the Supreme Court on challenge has not uh, taken the baton and run the relay race a little further. So high courts have been trying to push, certain high courts have been trying to push the envelope further. The third issue on compliance, which is completely related to compliance, is, apart from the first two, is the issue of prosecution of people who file false and malicious cases. In the, when Tada was put into place, the number of false cases was astounding. Just the 
union government finally decided to get rid of it not because of, of the legal challenges but the political climate in the country especially in the states of gujarat rajasthan punjab some of the northeastern states and of course andhra pradesh then united uh, was so volatile on this issue that it decided that they may not get the parliamentary majority purely on this issue because people were campaigning on the streets and asking the candidates is issue pe aapka kya rujhan hai what is your attitude on this particular issue in the debate in parliament when the new law was enacted the prevention of terrorism act quota uh, because of this concern a clause was introduced saying that if there was false if the case instituted was found as false and malicious the officers who uh, did this would also have to face music in terms of prosecution it was definitely a step in the right direction thanks to the experience of tada but in spite of it because of the courts not uh, uh, being able to go forward because of the what i raised earlier official sanctions not being available this became a non starter and was quietly dropped when the amended uh, unlawful activities prevention act was brought forward uh, this particular clause on punishing those who did malicious or false prosecutions nothing came forward if you look at the judgments of the delhi high court uh, in the asif iqbal uh, devangana kalita and uh, neherwal case you will see that the court has been extremely conscious of the problem and has in spite of the impediments uh, posed by the batali judgment in the supreme court has found a way to give some relief yet the supreme court while granting stay uh, uh, allowing bail to be remain but granting stay to the uh, home ministry appeal uh, said that it would not act as a precedent and was not available to anyone else apart from these three regressive would be a mild word uh, i shall for reasons of decorum shall not use stronger adjectives uh, the what do you do in this situation let me now jump from here to the international dimension india has signed some conventions the most important ones uh, the two core conventions the convention on civil and political rights and the convention on economic social and cultural rights were signed in in the last days of the moraji desai government uh, by uh, as more ratified by as signed and ratified by the moraji desai government the economic and social rights convention was signed during the emergency by mrs gandhi government uh, to prove that she was basically removing poverty internationally it didn't work but civil and political rights she didn't touch with the march 
and uh, you found the first janta experiment under Moraji Desai took some baby steps on this. But even here, uh, it filed uh, declarations, what India calls declarations, euphemistically re reservations under international law, uh, on a number of clauses, including, as I mentioned, Article 1 uh, relating to self-determination, um, which we shan't go into here, but it definitely could be a wonderful topic for uh, doctoral dissertation because much of the work here so far that I have seen is too state-centric to put it mildly. And, uh, some uh, uh, insurgent research uh, would be very good to take the issues forward and post them to the rest of the country. But composition is something that has been there's been a break has been put on. Uh, mandatory prosecution is also something that uh, 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 is not being looked at, and a number of other things. India has also not signed the first optional protocol or the second optional protocol to the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, the first optional protocol relates to the ability of any signatory to, of, to the UN Convention uh, to approach the UN Human Rights Committee in an individual complaint after having exhausted domestic remedies. India, of course, has not signed it. The second one relates to death penalty, which is a very wide subject separately for which perhaps at one point of time you should invite Anup Surendranath from the National Law School of Delhi to speak on who is has been doing some brilliant he and his team have been doing some brilliant work on the subject uh, the failure to comply with international law, the failure to adhere to national law puts you in a very peculiar situation. What does an activist, a lawyer who is abreast of both worlds do? Because the UN does not have a criminal police at its behest. All it can do is name and shame in the country uh, through the submission of the periodic reports. Even here, India is terrible. Again, a possible research topic. When India signed the and ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1979, it was required to submit periodic reports like every other signature and ratifying country uh, in a four-year periodic cycle. India did the first one and then it took a long time to submit the second one which uh, for the first time it faced some uh, non-governmental legal uh, responses and during the first uh, periodic report, no NGO from India or even international NGO made any powerful submissions to the UN Human Rights Committee, which is a body of very senior legal professionals, former judges or academics, elected in their individual capacity and not as governmental nominated people. They are, they can be nominated by governments, but are elected in their individual capacity, presently by the UN Human Rights Council, earlier by the Commission on Human Rights. The second periodic report 
for the first time saw the Naga People's Human Rights Organization, uh, represented by no less a person than Nandita Haksa, who many of you would have heard of, uh, talk about the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. The international community had not heard of this. Their eyes popped. And uh, they asked for a range of details, very pointed questions. And hoped that the government would comply with both requests. In 1997, the third periodic report came up. Yours truly did an alternate report, which is still available on our website uh, for you to peruse, and which puts the government on the back foot. The, the government uh, was represented by Ashok Desai, who is an extremely competent uh, legal personage and a very competent uh, bureaucrat, unlike many of the present bureaucrats, a very competent bureau bureaucrat, Madhukar Gupta, no longer alive, uh, who retired as Home Secretary. Uh, but in spite of the, the two very competent officers of the government of India, the evidence that we had marshaled uh, was overpowering for the committee. The committee put in a range of recommendations in its concluding observations to the government of India. The government of India did a Kumbha Karna Act or a Rip Van Winkle Act or whatever you want to call it. 1997 this is the year of the Lord 2021. So you can count the number of years. The cycle of reporting is four years. So India did not come up with a, the fourth periodic report. It is not to say that India is the only transgressor in the reporting cycle. Many countries, for lack of resources to do the report, uh, take time and are tardy in presenting their reports. But the interregnum asked, uh, used by the government of India was a little too long, especially by a country which called itself the world's largest democracy, and which had a fairly decent legal system. And uh, yet, uh, and no shortage of legal academics, both within and without the government. Finally, the Indian government decided that it would, when the, when the UN Human Rights Committee said that if India is not uh, planning to do, uh, submit its report, it will take up the hearing of India's record on human rights under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, CO motive. This, of course, uh, caused a flutter in uh, the portals of power in Delhi. And they quickly started the process and told the UN that they would get something going and have the report by August. They've, they have uh, parceled it out to the National Law University of Delhi. They have parceled out uh, reports relating to earlier, uh, to uh, relating to other conventions, also to the NLUD, like the India's periodic report to the Universal Periodic Review of the UN Human Rights Council. Now, there is no problem with the university taking on these things, or an academic body, or an NGO, or whatever else that the government wishes it be done. And the final touches, 
and the political nuances being crossed and dotted by the joint secretary or additional secretary in charge of the UN and international, international uh, intergovernmental organizations. But it's important that the draft be put in the public domain and not be considered a secret document, which is the problem in India. So you don't see the smoke coming out of the College of Cardinals, like in the election of the Vatican spoke, until you see the final version of the government report uh, on the UN website a few weeks before the actual hearing. Uh, so you don't know what the academics actually gave the uh, government of India and what the government of India, by the process of alchemy that they practice in the Ministry of External Affairs and Home Affairs, created or transmuted it into. Uh, this is troubling. I've, I've wrote, written a very strong piece on this, which is available uh, which in the leaflet, which I'm told uh, my good old friend, the Vice Chancellor of uh, NLUD, was very upset about. But um, I see my job as making people in power uncomfortable. So I have no uh, qualms about keeping, uh, keeping, making people uncomfortable. We are, so the August deadline was approaching. In fact, it was to be yesterday or today. And a few weeks ago, uh, the government of India once again approached the Human Rights Secretariat for an extension, which was given immediately. And we hopefully will see what emanates uh, in December, uh, mid-December is what I'm told. You will see that in 2017 also there was an attempt to use, uh, to, to, uh, to hold hearings on the periodic report of India to the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which of course did not take place. And that's why the present cycle. But you, if you go to the UN website and you go to the uh, ICCPR page and click on India in the country's problem, you will see that we and a few other NGOs have made submissions hoping that India's periodic report would come up for hearing. And so we did make advanced submissions on a number of issues which are still relevant till date. The purpose of my putting this across to you as a possible PhD thesis is that unlike many other countries, there is no peer review of the government's report before it is submitted to the UN. It is not discussed in parliament. It is not discussed in the standing committee of parliament. It is not discussed by a committee of outside experts. It just goes as the government report. The Oracle of South Block has spoken and all ye shall genu genuflect and accept. So that is not on in a democratic country. So how does one put this in back into the public domain? Uh, the only way to do it is by academic addressal of the issue through a good research project in a university by a clinic or by an individual or a group of individuals on this process at the Human Rights Committee. This can be repeated for the Convention on the Status of Women. This can be repeated for the Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and a range of other conventions. In the area of collective rights, given the capacity of the Indian trade unions, which to my horror is zilch, 
zero. Uh, the number of complaints to the ILO mechanisms, uh, conventions to which India has signed is very few, very few. But even to them, uh, the quality of the submissions are very poor. And uh, so is the government report, not that the government, uh, the Labour Ministry report any better. In fact, long, long time ago, in one, just as, as an aside, uh, I was representing Am Amnesty International's International Secretariat in 87 at the ILO annual session. And uh, I heard the Indian Labour Minister, some guy from I don't know where, uh, but, I mean, he, he just reads out a speech which some joint secretary writes and which the secretary has approved. And it was the pits. It really was the pits. So I went to the official data and I said, listen, I'll write it for you next time. From your perspective, I won't put any of my stuff. Uh, at least India shouldn't look worse than St. Kitts and Nevis Islands. Even they had a better statement. Uh, the, but it has not been interrogated. It has not been interrogated by any legal researchers doing work on labor rights domestically. And a lot of them have done very good work on domestic labor issues. But at the international level, uh, it has been completely ignored. Whereas you see the Philippines, uh, which as a country is much, much smaller, and the pool of academics working on these issues is much, much smaller, has done much more stronger and pointed uh, critiques on the ILO. So uh, I think we ought to look at our submissions at many of the international uh, bodies which have conventions with added on compliance machinery. The UNESCO, which has certain conventions, has not been addressed by any Indian organization on the issue of cultural rights, on the issue of language rights, etc. And this is a very big problem. Today is Onam for me and many Keralites. It's a big, big deal uh, today. Not for me, but I mean for the average Kerala, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, but while like Malayalam has a national language status, more people speak Gondi, a tribal language in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Odisha than Malayalam, and they have no status. No state support, and they are being subsumed by the, the state languages in each of the uh, states mentioned. So you will have a whole uh, people, culture, way of life slowly pass away into oblivion. This is how. Minority cultures are done away with. I would love to have a researcher working on these language rights issues. Put it in the national domain as well as put it in the international domain in the fora that are available to you. We also need to look at judicial delay. Now, the oft repeated panacea is more judges, more courtrooms, more court stuff, which certainly is part of the problem and which must be addressed. In fact, Justice J.S. Verma, one of you should see if uh, his family or the NHRC has a copy of his letter. NHRC's record keeping system is abysmal. They actually destroy documents after a certain period of time. I mean, they are vandals, to put it mildly. Uh, they, they destroy documents, shred documents. 
uh, they, uh, but his made a very useful suggestion to the then Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee, uh, saying that uh, those judges who had no retired judges who had not, nothing against them in their records and were mentally sound and health-wise okay uh, should be offered re-employment. Uh, even as High Court judges, even if, even if they were Supreme Court judges in the past, he himself offered to be a high, high Court judge and to sit in special sessions in the evening using the same premises, but of course hiring additional clerical and court staff to, uh, to, uh, to speed in the process. It was a good suggestion, but uh, others came, went, had esoteric suggestions which were good on paper but did not address the nitty gritty. Most lawyers in India are not even aware that, for example, in the UK, you may wait for a year for a trial to begin. I mean, after the charges are filed against you, the court uh, sets a date depending on the number of dockets in front of the court. Sometimes it takes six months to even as much as a year. But once the trial starts, even if you have a heart attack in the court, an adjournment is not easy. So most trials, unless they are extremely complex, will be over within five working days. And the more complex ones take about two to three weeks. It, it has a salutary message down the line. If you are litigating lawyer, ask a few litigating lawyers. The number of IAs filed, which are filed only to prolong the process. And it can go on and on and on. In fact, one of the plywood companies a few years ago, ago had a brilliant ad. Chalte hi rahe, chalte hi rahe. Advertising the durability of their plywood, uh, and the on the screen was flashing a documentary on a court proceeding where the uh, litigants and the prosecution and the judge, uh, from young people gracefully age uh, to people in their evening uh, evenings of their life, and that is the situation. Uh, so uh, the, most people. Even when they uh, have been hurt, are very wary of addressing the court system uh, because unless you have deep pockets, it's impossible to get easy and quick justice. What I am laying emphasis on is that if you do this in a few cases where day-to-day -day trials take place, which was supposed to be done by the mechanism of the special courts introduced by uh, Arun Jaitley in the first uh, India government, uh, which was subsequently cut down by the subsequent NDA and UP governments, the budgets for it. So now they are very few and far between. Uh, uh, put the fear of God into both the prosecution and those who filed uh, uh, frivolous lit litigation. You found uh, an immediate effect in that particular district when a particular magistrate's court or a particular session's court uh, took up this uh, way of doing things. This needs to be done. The Malayamath committee did not address any of these issues adequately. They had uh, absurd things which you can see on my website. Article. I was actually put by him on the Criminal Justice Reforms Commission, which predated the Malayamath Committee uh, when he was Vice Chancellor of the West Bengal Institute of Judicial Sciences. And very soon I found that the whole committee was to uh, not really put in hard hitting uh, elemental reforms. Uh, but was to actually uh, reduce the space for due process in the system. So I quickly resigned 
made a song and dance at a meet at a meeting as I usually can, and uh, supported by of, uh, a very senior uh, personage who retired as governor of Mizoram, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, who had served as the acting director for CBI, and a very uh, honest and upright officer who said, who clearly said that all this will only help us, the police. Uh, it's nothing to do with helping the litigant. And he too resigned and we both decided to call it a day. And then of course, when the smoke finally came out of the chimney, we saw the Malayabad committee report recommending the adversarial committee. And I won't say anything more. You can go to my website or you can see the brilliant essay uh, done by Professor Upendra Bakshi as an introduction to the Amnesty International report on the Malayabad uh, committee. Uh, it should be available on the Amnesty website. My reports are available on mine. And you, you, uh, they actually recommended greater incorporation of the in inquisitorial system without even having studied the French system or the European system. They went to France, they reached Paris on a Friday evening. And as any one of you knows, the weekend is sacrosanct for the, for the European. So they met nobody except the protocol officers in the French foreign ministry and other things. And left on Monday for London and wrote the base on the basis on that report on allegedly on the interaction that they had with the French legal system. I was amused but also concerned. So I, being a blunderbuss, stormed into the office of the then Home Secretary, Mr. Gopalaswamy, who later on became Chief Election Commissioner, but I knew him as a decent Secretary General of the National Human Rights Commission. And uh, I asked him, what is this? So he, uh, knowing that I speak Tamil fluently, uh, he sat me down and he said, hey, they had a junket on a weekend and saying, why are you at up? Uh, why are you at up? Uh, so that was it. The inquisitorial system uh, recommendation of the Malay Matkar. You read it uh, and you'll see how flimsy the argumentation is. And then you can read my critique of what they have written, apart from the aside that I mentioned. There are a number of other issues that need to be taken up domestically. The complete diminution of the rights of indigenous people, the failure of state governors to exercise their powers available to them in the scheduled areas under the constitution. India has not signed the major ILO convention relating to indigenous people. It has only signed the very ancient uh, 107 convention, which clearly has been built upon and needs, uh, has been built upon in the, the latter convention. Then we come to refugee rights. Again, a huge area of work that needs to be done. Not on the law itself, because uh, Professor Chimney's book on refugee rights is clearly, at least for the moment, the last word on the subject. And he's done some brilliant work on it. But its application on the ground, no one has really done any work. It's useful for you, you to do. There have been articles in the media, etc. There have been pamphlet size, booklet size reports by even us, which is available on the website. But a properly researched book on the situation of the Sri Lankan Tamil which is an ISO 
since 1983. If you are not able to address a problem since 1983, then even delays must have limits. Similarly, the situation of other refugee populations which are not even thought of and the abysmal, I shall not use a stronger word, abysmal uh, decision of the Supreme Court in the Rohingya refugees matter. I have done a very strong critique of it which is a, you can see on my website or the leaflet uh, website. The, online magazine that Indra Jai Singh and Anand Grover bring out. Uh, what to talk about the IDPs, the internet displacement. We have one of the largest populations of internet displaced people. People displaced by development projects and people displaced as they are called conflict-induced displacement, both to be re resettled after 20 years, 30 years, and in one particular development-induced displacement, horror of horrors, over 60 years. Those displaced, the majority of the people displaced through the building of the Rorkila steel plant, are yet to be rehabilitated adequately. Again, no scrutiny by parliament, by legislative bodies, by standing committees. What is the other way to introduce an element of public accountability and scrutiny? It is academic research. It is a good PhD, which not only is transmuted into a book, but is also transmuted into articles both in domestic and international journals of repute, which forces the government to put the issue back on the front burner. Because at the moment, uh, if you understand the language of bureaucracy in Delhi, quick disposal in 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 Delhi's bureaucratic language means in the past the dustbin, now the shredder. And uh, harm under consideration means it's filed in some voluminous file somewhere in the basement of not block, never to be seen by any human until the next fire takes place and they declare that they've lost a few thousand files again. This happens periodically, very convenient, of course. But because you are not in a position to investigate into the hallowed precincts of the Home Ministry, as to why they have not sent them to the National Archives, the question that Parliament never looks at. You look at other issues also uh, in terms of the, uh, the government's availability to do things uh, where uh, the right to protest is being constantly under attack. I did most of the drafting for the petitions file, which got us temporary decent orders in the Jantar Mantar case. Uh, when they banned even protests at Jantama. But in spite of that, the space for protests in the national capital has been squeezed. And in the state capitals, you run the gauntlet of arrests and long prosecutions. And uh, unless you are really battle-hardened and have a rhinoceros hide, you decide to genuflect to these complete 
basically illegal orders, which the court has held illegal in numerous occasions. Again, a PhD thesis dying to be addressed, asking to be addressed. The right of protest under Indian law. Then more academic issue, the whole issue of due process. It is generally considered that due process has arrived in India thanks to the Menaka Gandhi judgment, that it is not the earlier situation. If you look at the decisions of the Supreme Court, it would be very useful to have a good academic with the time, because even though there are very good lawyers doing some work on this, they just do not have the time to put the legal acumen to the rigor of academic research that a PhD thesis would require. And this is where I think uh, some of you can think of this as an option. The unfortunate initial amendments to the freedom of speech, which haunt us until today, again is something that needs to be looked at. The reasoning of the Babri Masjid judgment is something that needs to be looked at. If, if, if it is as convoluted as convoluted can be, uh, while there have been some excellent critiques of it in the media and by informed articles in some legal uh, websites, it requires much more in the form of an incisive uh, thing uh, relating it to the earlier judgments of the actual destruction of the masjid uh, at that point of time and the Venkatechevaya judgment relating to the arrest of Kalyan Singh, the then Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. So there is a paucity of issues. I could give you any number apart from what I have briefly outlined here. I can also, if some of you are interested, point you in the direction of initial resources, uh, which of course you would then have to interrogate further and go ahead. I am very happy about this initiative taken by Professor Nanda and the National Law School in Hyderabad. And I think I'll uh, pause here and stop here, give you the break that I was told you will have and allow you to fire your broadsides at me in terms of further questions or clarifications or further information. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nair. Uh, so what we'll do is, I mean, what I think what uh, Ravi has done very, very effectively through the morning is that he has told us exactly what are the particular difficulties of being a, even a human rights compliant country, you know, in the, in the sense of there is something in the way in which our entire, uh, our entire discourse has been constituted or the way we look at the whole area of human rights, which kinds of makes us, makes, you know, like, uh, makes us at all point of times be, be deviating from or not really conforming. And we've not really studied this. The, the critical factor is that we just say, oh, it's not implemented. But exactly what is not implemented and why is it not implemented is, I think, a, a very, very important dimension that uh, uh, Professor Nair has brought home to us. And that connection that needs to be made is something that I'd ask you to be reflecting on. For me, that's the biggest takeaway, you know, that, okay, when you speak in terms of non-implementation, you should also think about 
what is it that is you know like uh, integrally there in the manner in which we have situated the relationship between say law and human rights or the fact of how is what is it that makes for us not being a really unique of law conforming country why why is it that law as such is the first casualty and we think that okay if you are possessed of power uh if you really considered powerful then it's important that you shouldn't be following the law so i would like uh allow for a 10 minutes break to all of you and professor asanthi is already put in our good morning uh, dr nayar are yeah, you back please 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 it was a pleasure to listen to you thank you and, uh, we have one question and i hope the others will also put in their question so for now we will start with the question that we have yeah which is about that. yeah language yeah yeah you want to talk some more about yeah, yeah first of all let me just quickly uh, interject uh, sorry first of all let me quietly interject i am no academic i took uh, i do i have taught in uh, universities across the world uh, done uh, clinical classes in yale in iowa university taught a whole ma course on human rights in mahidol in thailand uh, refugee law courses in uh, the orissa law school and the delhi law school apart from uh, lady shiram colleges on peace and conflict studies the human rights uh, component and of course the government at the during the vajpayee regime actually put me on the ugc curriculum development committee on human rights uh, and uh, we were able to make the curriculum pretty decent for the ma uh, human rights courses that were then subsequently introduced by the human rights but i'm basically again academic and i'm an intel loper in the world of uh, academia always envious of uh, the time for is of research available to academics so having said that uh, i'll come back to the quickly to the question uh, the language issue is the most emotive issue in any culture and country the, if you look at the debates of the central legislative assembly before independence or the constituent assembly as to what would constitute the national language was one of the fiercest debates that took place uh initially of course spearheaded by the uh, madras presidency and subsequently tamil nadu it also found an echo in number of other languages like uh, bengali and uh, odia which felt it was being subsumed by bengali at that point of time uh, and of course in the hindi heartland where there is now a sudden new resurgence of minority languages in the hindi indoganetic plain uh, which have uh, which feel that they have been subsumed by hindi the most uh, pronounced expression of that is the uh, language rights movement of the bhojpuri language in north bihar and the terai region of nepal where they have tried to create a complete alternate uh, cultural channel for the preservation of bhojpuri and uh, they have been pretty successful uh they been pretty successful uh it's a very emotive subject uh, for example urdu which was not uh is not the language of muslims alone uh but has come to be considered as such to its detriment because the state uh, over a period of time portrayed it as such and everybody else went along with the that portrayal language can be destructive uh in polity 
uh, and we escaped it uh, thanks to the sensible attitude of uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri when he tried to tinker with the three language form formula. Uh, Tamil Nadu was up in flames. I was a young student then in Madurai. I went and studied in Madurai for two years, hoping my, my parents sent me uh, to Madurai, hoping I would learn a little bit of Southern Indian culture because I was a Bombay kid. Uh, and uh, so I went and stayed with my aunt, who was a medical professional there. And uh, I saw the ferocity of the movement as a young school student um, and uh, fortunately there was a very senior principal secretary to the prime minister who was intellectually also very competent unlike the many that we have presently uh, mr lk jha who retired as governor of jnk many years ago uh, who advised the Prime Minister that this will be our undoing if we push this forward. And so uh, Shastraji, to his eternal credit, uh, went two steps backward. That same sagacity was not shown in Pakistan on the issue of Urdu and uh, Bengali and the creation of Bangladesh as a whole new country was a result of that attempt to diminish the usage of Bengali in official discourse, not in the popular public domain. So language is an extremely emotive thing. The whole language issue also, let us not forget, was a burning subject in the Punjab. Uh, and an important uh, component of the Punjabi sub, Subha, Sabha uh, agitation. In fact, uh, one of the reasons for the Sikh discomfort with the New Delhi is that New Delhi in the 50s and 60s and early 70s in the census, in the census, in the national census enumeration encouraged Hindus to put uh, Hindi as their mother tongue in the census to prove that they were adequate Hindus and it could not be only a Punjabi speaking state. Whereas every single Hindu hardly spoke Hindi and spoke, wrote and uh, spoke uh, Punjabi, uh, sorry, Urdu or Punjabi written in the Gurmukhi speak, script in Punjabi or the uh, Urdu script. And in fact, all land records in the Punjab are all still kept in Urdu. Or horror of horrors to the uh, many of you in Persian, the numbers are kept as orders uh, in a system which was like the British Domesday Book given to, uh, to them by Shesha Suri, continued by Akbar, and uh, went on until 35. 1935, when Persian was slowly uh, put on the sidelines and Urdu was introduced. So if you want to look at all land records, if you don't know Urdu, uh, then don't look at land records in Northern India. Uh, look at something else. Uh, secondary information found else. So language is a very emotive issue. We have to be careful on how we've dealt with it. The last, both the last two governments, the UPA as well as the NDA, have been uh, not adequately uh, sensitive to this issue, and uh, this is going to this is going to be a powder keg in the near future, unless uh, again some good academic research has there has been some very good academic, but academic research of a different kind, or academic research which while being academically thorough and factual uh, is also lends itself to parliamentary lobbying, campaigning, 
editorials, opinion pieces, etc. Because most of what the PhD theses and excellent doctorates that I sometimes come across uh, are not used. You never find them in the public domain unless somebody has taken the pains to actually uh, go ahead and uh, publish it uh, with some publisher or the other. So uh, language is something that needs to be very careful. Uh, we perhaps might need to look at the Swiss model where they allow uh, Italian, German, French and a very small uh, Italian and Romance speaking population all to have equal say uh, in the process of the administration. Uh, the Tamil Nadu High Court actually talked about introducing more Tamil in the High Court proceedings. But because of lack of consensus amongst the other High Courts, uh, something that has not been addressed adequately, but it will come back. There's no way you can, because uh, language is uh, very important and you can have whole cultures uh, decimated. We're talking about Afghanistan. Let, I'm able to uh, long winded, but I want to make the point. If most Indians don't know, you see my latest piece on my website uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, do you know that there are 200,000 uh, Rahui speaking people in Afghanistan, in uh, uh, in uh, northern Af Afghanistan and uh, eastern uh, Iran. Now, two hundred thousand in Afghanistan. The a million and a quarter in Pakistan's Baluchistan province and Iran and a small segment in Tajikistan. Now, if you quickly Google after this talk, Rahui is not an Indo-Aryan language. It is a Dravidian proto-Australoid language. It is most of the words are akin to Tamil. It has nothing to do with any of the languages spoken in Pakistan, modern day Iran or northern India. Uh, now it's in the one million population in Pakistan and Baluchistan have forgotten Rahui. They have the Pakistan government very intelligently over a period of time uh, quietly uh, subsumed it with Baluch language. So ethnically, while they are still uh, Rahui, their language, their culture, their social mores, all are lost to them. So while they have converted over a period of centuries to Sunni form of Islam, many of their social customs were pre-Islamic, which are still retained in the Afghan Brahui, but not retained in the larger uh, Brahui population in Afghanistan. So you can destroy cultures completely. Uh, so language, because they are a uh, community which live, lives in a limbo has not had access to education they have not had uh, until recently uh, a few graduates to even put their case forward uh, they have lost lost out this cannot happen to indian languages uh, regional languages which are highly developed most of them are very highly developed and so equal space is there. so uh, do not tinker with language but there are some people in Delhi who, of course, know everything in the world. And uh, so one has to be careful. I, uh, I think I think thank you for bringing out that whole connection between language and power. Also. Yeah. And particularly in the Indian context, I think the question of language is so tied up with the question of federalism that your uh, states also were organized around language because also language becomes a way where you, where you can actually uh, make the religion irrelevant and the language becomes the binding uh, factor between communities and you know which uh, otherwise can be split on the ground especially in the south and in the northeast you know you can find that language acts as a community builder much better than uh, other, other ways 
So yeah. thank you for bringing out those and that connection to power. And I think that's very important for students to take note of as they are, of course, writing in English and you know uh, all of the work that is done in law is unfortunately largely done in English. Yeah. Uh, but if they at least have this consciousness of you know how language becomes uh, this this power, this tool of power. I think they might approach the whole question of language along with other categories to be more sensitive to how these questions pan out. And the fact that you're talking about tribal languages and the erosion of culture by the erosion of erosion of knowledge to the erosion of um, language. Uh, so there is uh, another question about the clinical approach of study that you were talking about. Yeah, it's extremely important. And uh, depending on the needs of the academic calendar, uh, some element of clinical work is absolutely essential to make sure that the uh, individual looking at a subject in the university uh, hits the ground running as soon as he or she leaves the university. Uh, I have been a permanent fixture of the thesis RE courts since I was a student, observing how young lawyers, unless they are chaperoned with a senior lawyer find it very difficult to find their feet in the lower courts is easier for them to do it find their feet in the high courts or the supreme court because procedure in the lower courts is king and uh, procedure how much you have read the crpc comes only from actual application in in a court of law uh, and uh, I know that for a fact, and I have done a whole textbook on uh, the CRPC uh, for Oxford University Press, which you can still see. Unfortunately, OUP has closed its down its legal uh, division, and so after its third revision, they are unable to do its fourth revision, taking into view what's happening. But it's essential that some amount of clinical work be done. For example. You can't dis discuss refugee rights in India, uh, in southern India, for example, or the Tamil, Sri Lankan Tamil question, without having visited the various waves of refugees and displaced people and retur returnees and making the distinction between uh, the three categories. Most uh, average lay Indian folks, including senior editors and, and journalists uh, when writing on these subjects in established newspapers and media organizations uh, use the words interchangeably and you see that it comes because it, there is a lack of uh, a corpus of academic work in the public domain making these distinctions so you, did you look at the repatriates who are also considered as refugees by most people from the hill country in Sri Lanka, who are now settled in the Valparai area of Coimbatore district in Tamil Nadu, adjoining the Nilgiris? Or are you looking at those who came after the Shastri or Srimao and the subsequent Indra Srimao, uh, um, uh, the, not Srimao, the elderly, the elder Bandarana agreement, or the ones who came after the 1983 pogroms against the Tamils in the whole of Sri Lanka, not just the north and the east. The programs would have had their worst in Colombo. Uh, so uh, there is not that thing and so today when the superior courts are dealing with the issue of citizenship of uh, of repatriates or those uh, who have come as refugees post conflict induced refugees who came 
uh, post-1983, uh, you can even see the court fumbling uh, for putting them in watertight compartments. They don't. They are watertight compartments. The whole history of the repatriate uh, is completely different from the conflict-induced in refugee of post-1983. So it's important that we understand this can be understood only by good clinical work, which results in articles in the media, which results in good academic work being quoted in courts of law, uh, in and available in the vernacular as well as the official language uh, uh, in different states. So I think clinical work, just to give you one example, is that or, for example, when I uh, suggested it to a professor in Orissa when I was doing a claim, uh, teaching uh, a course on international human rights law there, I was there for a couple of weeks for that particular course, uh, I made a suggestion saying in the summer holidays, as I have a large number of intern applications from your university, will you give me, uh, allow me to take 10 of your students to Koraput uh, and Kyonjar districts to look at the cases filed in the local courts against tribals on the charge of being a Nasserite. There are under trials there for eight years, nine years, with no legal representation until today. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I'm not given to exaggeration. I'm uh, given to forceful presentation, definitely, which I'm accused of being a little too abrasive sometimes by friends in the government. Uh, but. Uh, Lawyers in the district courts are not willing to go to villages which require sometimes a day and a half to go and come back. And if you don't find the villager because he's gone into the forest to collect forest produce, then either you have the capacity to stay in a place which is mosquito infested and snake ridden and are willing to sleep on the ground. On on soggy red mud, uh, you quickly return to the district headquarters and are reluctant to go back. So it requires you sitting there. I would encourage all of you to look at the history of the uh, American legal aid committees. In fact, the National Alliance of Colored People's Legal Committee uh, did all the work in the early 60s, which led to the civil rights legislation of the Johnson and subsequent administrations. It came only through clinical work initially, which resulted in litigation in the federal courts and uh, finally we had they had an attorney general who took all these cases and did the run with it robert kennedy and uh, uh, there's some fascinating uh, books uh, on the evolution of uh, this apart from uh, thurgood marshall's own autobiography so uh, clinical work is absolutely, you can't do clinical work. In fact, the, uh, the detention uh, cases in the, of the foreigners cases in Assam, uh, which is still pending, and the detention centers, the last order being that the detention centers should be completed uh, because the present holding centers are the pits. Uh, came out of clinical work by a number of young students and activists from different organizations from all over Assam as well as uh, India, who went there, spent weeks together and collected the information that was necessary to put together the litigation, which has put the uh, government in a spot. So that's why you can see uh, 
the rules and regulations of the CAA uh, suddenly put on the back burner. We've already had four extensions and they've asked and they've just been given another fifth extension until January of next year. Uh, so the clinical work is absolutely crucial. That kind of clinical work is not available uh, in a number of other areas. I had uh, uh, grumbled, mumbled, and begged uh, friends in 2002 in Gujarat saying that it is not enough to do commissions of inquiry, non-governmental, with important people like Justice Krishnaya, whose committee did excellent work. Uh, but along with that, you had to do clinical work on each and every individual case, which required uh, a lot of perspiration, a little bit of inspiration, as Einstein put it, 99% uh, perspiration, 1% inspiration. And uh, that would have resulted in a different kind of legal address of those cases, which the courts would have found it difficult to fob off as they have done uh, even in important uh, uh, case, cases in, in the Gujarat uh, aftermath of the Gujarat uh, pogrom of 2002. So that's important. This also did not happen in the Punjab excellent non-governmental commission of inquiry reports but without uh, clinical work done by legal students supervised by academics they do not turn into material for litigation they are good for publicity they are good for public campaigning they are good for keeping memory alive but that is the view we call I think particularly for students who want to do research in human rights, I think if they're not able to ground their theory in particular contexts and they have not never been to the field or never met with the people that they want to articulate on behalf of, I think it becomes almost impossible to talk about human rights research if uh, they haven't had any element of the clinical component. Unfortunately, what has happened in law is uh, for a, for the last time, we thought that it is a it is a practitioner's law, and the academics don't need to really invest in it. And the next half, it's become very academic with very little, you know, practical component. Finding that perfect balance between, you know, uh, a practice rooted theory or a theory rooted in practice, whichever way you want it, I think that has been a struggle. All law schools have uh, have have uh, you know really uh, engaged with. We ourselves, our university have started clinics which are which have turned as social justice clinics with this idea that the clinics can be a very powerful way of uh, carrying on good research. Uh, what your other what otherwise you would not be able to do, the clinics would give you an opportunity. And I think it's it's very it's a very good question coming from budding researchers that they engage with the clinical aspects of the law, then their own research becomes much more rooted and you know it becomes grounded and it comes out something that's very useful for everyone so i thought that was very good that we had that question out there and people are able to understand uh, you know how to do it's, it's and but and maybe would want to talk a little more about it because sometimes what would just happen when we ask students to just go to courts and sit in courts and observe it without the necessary you know uh, tools with which you understand what is happening uh, sometimes the entire fieldwork empirical aspect can become very meaningless where people just do it as a matter of routine rather than really understand processes. Uh, so how much do you think from the point of in, in the field of human rights, uh, what kind of I just wanted to add in a word there, uh, Vasanti, that I felt that amongst the things which uh, um, Dr. Nair's intervention is saying very strongly, and I, it's important for us as legal academics to be comprehending what is our position within the political system? You know, we have in some manner almost uh, marginalized ourselves and don't really feel that we have a role to play. I think the, I mean, for me, the most important thing that he's saying is it's not talking about just, you know, how you could become, say, a lot of clinical education comes out as, okay, how can you become a better lawyer? Whereas what is being said is how can you make your work, that is the academic work that you do, 
count within the political system and that you have a role to play that you are the ones who can be providing for that evidence on the strength of which you can compel be it the judiciary or it is like other people in authority that they put on the back foot that that kind of work, i mean because it's like see, amongst the things that is our advantage is that so much of our bread and butter doesn't have to come from it and because it doesn't have to come from it we can provide the kind of you know the, the sort of right kind of fodder for other work to happen and i think very often as students as well as as teachers that self image is missing that you know that you you don't understand that you are actually a very vital you know cog in that wheel and you can be doing you can make other wheels move and unless and until you have that kind of understanding of your own role you tend to downplay your research it's going you know it's very much with the point that you were making earlier that you collect the material you do the work but you don't know what to do with it i think the the point which um, ravi made both in relation to whether he was talking about gujarat or he was talking about punjab or he was talking about every other you know great example of misuse of authority that if this had been properly documented and then disseminated you would find it more difficult you know people would find it at least you would make it tougher for them that impunity would be challenged in some manner i think that connection needs to be very strongly made that you know human rights is not some some rhetoric that you are supposed to put forth it requires you to put shoulder to wheel and to produce that evidence i i just wanted to chip this chip in and say that yeah. that connection i think needs to be sort of reiterated on an again and again basis yeah so i just to add you know just a quick interjection when you send i have seen this in delhi university and i used to tell friends in delhi university सही कि भाई जब आप किसी स्टूडेंट को तीस हजार ही बेचते हैं यू सेंड स्टूडेंट टू तीस हजार ही ऑब्जर्व कोर्ट प्रोसीडिंग्स मोस्टली इज नॉट इवन लुक्ड एट लिस्ट ऑफ केसेस बीइंग हर्ड दैट डे एंड हैज नॉट फाउंड आउट व्हाट दे पर्टेन टू ही और शी so you sit in a court you find some guy being brought into the court uh in a shabby clothes he is stands in a corner the prosecutor does not even call him or her uh, to the bench uh and the uh, police officer from the jail who has brought him to extend the remand gets gives the court clerk uh, the nayab court the papers for the further extension of the remand now and is taken away the magistrate has not asked him ki ha bhai tumhara wakil aaya hai except in rare cases kyu nahi aaya hai Now, the younger lot of magistrates are asking these questions in delhi i don't know what the situation is in in uh, andhra or other or telangana or such other states but in delhi the younger lot of magistrates uh, it have started asking these questions otherwise you find that somebody has been in prison for 6 months uh, and uh, nobody has asked him and he's a hand the sections that he is under are all available some petty offense but because he has not been represented so it needs then you need to um, seek permission as an institution from the district judge to be allowed to interview some of these people before they are taken back to the judicial custody in the hawala you will find very interesting case material for further litigation the uh, yale and uh, in particular has actually through its clinical program introduced a program of litigation with uh, senior uh, academics and uh, outside lawyers helping the students put together the
the wherewithal for the for initiating the litigation and following it through. In fact, almost all the death penalty work in the US is done through now, done through this process, the anti-death penalty work. Uh, this has been copied very intelligently by uh, Professor uh, uh, Anup uh, Surendranath at the National Law School in Delhi, who has been using many of the students to go and see uh, these long-term uh, people on death row in jails in the middle of nowhere uh, in India. And the work that not only ensues in a results in a good report but has also resulted in very good uh, litigation uh, in the Supreme Court leading to the relief to a number of these people in different ways. Uh, so have a look uh, at things like that. This could be replicated on a number of areas. Uh, presently number of tribal under trials rotting in Chhattisgarh uh, in spite of very good lawyers doing brilliant legal work in Chhattisgarh. In fact, there's a women's group in uh, Raipur, which in my opinion should is the last word in, uh, in helping poor indigent tribals. They've done great work in the most difficult circumstances. Now, uh, that's the kind of work that needs to be replicated by clinic, human rights clinics in by in from different universities. I think I'm, I'll stop there. So to, to, to move tracks, I think the next question uh, deals with the dilution of fundamental principles of criminal laws by counter legislations and uh, their impact on human rights. Oh, I could write a tome on it. Exactly. It's a very wide question, but I think... No, 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 but I, I, I'll, try, I, I'll try to be brief. Uh, in fact, if uh, the questioner wants to have a look, he or she can quickly look at my website and see the pieces that I've done over the years in Economic and Political Weekly uh, in particular, but subsequently in the caravan on the UAPA and sedition laws, but in the in, in, in on, on Porter and Tada in EPW. Uh, I am the only one who's actually filed uh, information, uh, uh, not just in the human rights international bodies on anti-terrorist legislation in India, in India. Uh, but also I think even I am one of the few NGOs in the world, uh, my NGOs that is, uh, which has filed a complaint to the counter-terrorism committee of the UN Security Council on India's record on human rights. Uh, it's again available on my website, the submission. Didn't make me the most popular person in Delhi in the in government circles counter terrorism legislation in india if you it's, it's, it's again a wonderful dissertation there's some excellent uh, articles and monographs written by uh, lawyers and academics on each of these laws but if you put i went back to uh, pre-independence india perhaps started with some of the Bengal legislation and then moved on to the Rowlatt Act, you will see that you can drive, drive a tank through the Rowlatt Act uh, clauses and it will be very difficult for you to put a needle through the UAPA clauses. So the refinement of the tools of repression and the diminution of space uh, for due process has widened uh, in a democratic India versus what was uh, a colonial India. So I, it's important to put it together in a wider framework, all these little small pieces of on Tada, on Porter, on cases, etc. Just look at that. It would, it, it would, it would make a fascinating uh, PhD thesis. Uh, I'm happy to uh, 
give you material that uh, I have. But if you uh, went to the Bombay High Court uh, or the Delhi High Court, there are you'd get tons of material uh, that uh, would serve you in good stead. And then, of course, a few good interviews on the ground would make uh, something very good. We haven't had something uh, a strong critic of it academically like the Americans have had on the Un-American Activities Act of the McCarthyite regime. And it's important because anything and everything is terrorist today. There is absolutely no un understanding of the usage of the term. And the fact is that you are diminishing the The majesty of the law by using it so loosely. If you keep arresting people, uh, as the British did, for wearing a Gandhi topi, you created a whole reservoir of support for Gandhi, who were happy to flout it. So when you criminalize every small petty offense as a terrorist offense, as has recently been done in the state of Uttar Pradesh, a, F, a Facebook post, a public statement by a member of parliament, everything is terrorist. Uh, then uh, what are you doing? Just what are you doing? And the courts have not come down heavily on this. Uh, the first signs of hope were the, uh, was the order of the uh, Delhi High Court on the bail applications of these two uh, young students and the other boy from Jamia. Uh, which is definitely a step in the right direction, but has now got stuck in the Supreme Court. And uh, I'm still waiting for the Supreme Court to look at so much more litigation, uh, which is eight and nine years where the stay order has been given. So it happens. You and concomitantly look at the growth completely uncontrolled of the intelligence agencies. There is no parliamentary oversight. There is no oversight by the Comptroller and Auditor General. I, I, as a senior intelligence officer, if I, if I signed off in the intelligence uh, bureau's budget, paid to confidential informers five lakhs, and then use that money to buy jewelry for my wife, uh, no one would be the wiser. And it happens. And I'm not uh, being facetious. Uh, many years ago, the uh, our external intelligence raw sent two officers to Canada, to the, to the state of British Columbia, Vancouver in particular, to look at Sikh uh, support, expatriate Sikh support for the Punjab uh, troubles. These two guys went there, sent their first two reports in a few months, and then stopped reporting. They, because they had been given such a long, such a big tranche of money, uh, Canada then offered, it still does, citizenship by investment. So they just invested all the money uh, in Canadian government bonds and acquired citizenship and lived happily ever after, or live happily ever after in Canada. Now, these are the guys who are uh, cooking up the terrorist cases. There is no oversight. There is no parliamentary accountability. See my piece in the SAFMA journal, which is South Asia Free Media Association journal, available on the web, or EPW, a shorter piece in the EPW, again, on democratic control and accountability of intelligence agencies. It's we, we, no other country in the world I'm not saying they're great in other countries. The best law available today is in, in New Zealand on the control, democratic control. Australia has a weak law. But while the, the US controls intelligence agencies by a wonderful uh, congressional and Senate intelligence committee, which is very tough in closed hearings, if necessary, otherwise open hearings on intelligence hearings. And if you can access C-SPAN, the uh, equivalent of parliament uh, news in India, 
you can see it live the hearings and here the hearings of how uh, the intelligence is called up uh, so democratic accountability creating a democratic country is is not just the courts it's also to create the concomitant temperament and institutions that supplement and complement the work of the courts and, and let me just uh, take the liberty uh, of the professor in conducting this program uh, is that uh, let me also say um, a brilliant uh, phd thesis will look on should look at the diminution of national institutions the so called national human rights commission the national women's commission the national minorities commission now the bifurcated national dalit commission and the uh, tribal commission they are a joke they are a joke i have not studied in depth uh, the dalit commission or the scheduled tribes commission but i have gone chapter and verse on the national human rights commission uh, and uh, they missed uh, being de recognized in the un as part of the international body of uh, affiliated national institutions only by a whisker thanks to political lobbying by the government and not on the strength of their submission uh, now this would mean a brilliant thesis which would put the spotlight on the fact that national institutions are not working the, the the court calls it a post office the national human rights commission the supreme court a bench 10 years ago and it's all forgotten by the present benches and you are referring cases like the important political cases where the nhrc is not uh, uh, neutral like in the bengal violence during the elections case definitely not neutral so Uh, now again that would make a brilliant because if you don't have national institutions uh, the complementary pillars of creating a democratically accountable state are not there and uh, also if some of you uh, are allowed by the university to think of doing looking at parliamentary debates on human rights parliamentary questions on human rights parliamentary motions on human rights uh, on uh, looking at the various committee work on on human rights on the uh, it's just not there it's not there uh, yeah, that's why the quality of questions in parliament is so abysmal i was as a young student used to do uh, research work there was it was not the age of computers and and uh, laptops and such other things so uh, madhulime who was a very good parliamentarian i used to do his clippings nothing great uh, apart from clippings i was a uh, wet behind the years 18 year old and after college i i used to go to his house and he would uh, tell me go to the parliament library and uh, get me all the clippings on these subjects and the parliamentary research as such as assistants were happy to help me as much as they wanted because no other parliamentarian used their services they were basically the women were reading seminar and the men those days were reading illustrated weekly of india uh, so they were just bored stiff and they were quite happy to uh, help me collect all the clippings from mr lemay who would then of course turn it into some french and criticism of parliament he was one of the best parliamentarians of his time uh so that kind of parliamentary assistance work uh in the area of legal reform criminal reform uh, justice reform etc is something that you can look at in terms of clinical work uh, at some point of time in the next uh, or the uh a subsequent academic uh, segment so i mean there's uh, there's no shortage of research topics and avenues to it's uh, the imagination is only uh, circumscribed by our ability to look at the opportunities available i'll stop here i think you really brought out that need for documentation usually a lot of people think of human rights work as just you know emotive work 
uh, but you know that painstaking gathering of material and the documentation that you're bringing out is like so useful the next two questions i thought if i could just combine them because one is on um, indigenous people and local communities on access and benefit sharing and the other is the inter relationship between human rights and uh, environmental law so i think if i if i can if i understand it correctly the question is what is it that a human rights perspective brings in uh, to to movements or to issues which can be studied through other lenses as well uh, you also talked about labor law for example and labor issues so what is it that a human rights perspective can give us especially for researchers uh, which perhaps uh, is very different from other areas and other perspectives which can emerge uh, i given the uh, uh, need for brevity of of my uh, interjections because of the clock uh, i'll i'll be brief and i'll take up the environmental one by quickly saying that i am a babe in the woods on that in that area i have not looked at environmental law at all i have looked at uh, cases where activists have been arrested because they've been fighting for environmental rights or displacement uh, or stopping a big dam or a mine but i have not looked at environmental law at all so uh, the whole area of fourth generation human rights uh, as put internationally is something that i am uh, in my infancy uh, so I, i i having said that i'll move down to Indi the indigenous question 8% of india's population is indigenous there is not an understanding of what it means to their incorporation into the body politic into their cognizance as citizens uh, contributing to the common weal uh and uh, if you look at chatisgarh orissa jharkhand and of course parts of andhra this is the largest land grab in history after the white settler came to australia and said it was terra nullius and we have it because nobody nobody was inhabited the aborigines uh, didn't exist and the white settler displacement of the american indian every single treaty made by the american state signed in many cases by the president and not the secretary of the interior or the secretary of tribal affairs was broken in fact if you will interestingly see that the some of the official treaties signed between the jharkhandi tribes and the canadian indigenous people are almost similar in language because they were done by the same british officials who drafted them in canada and then were posted in in south bihar as it was then considered or vice versa drafted them in jhar uh, in present day jharkhand and then also did similar legislation with the lakota or the inuit or such other people in in canada now whereas the lakota and the inuit have brilliant support uh, from academic community in uh, in canada and have been able to get a fair amount of self determination over their land and resources that has been missing to a great extent in the us uh, and definitely missing in india in spite of the existence of the fifth and sixth schedule which the governor has powers to implement uh, without consulting the chief minister he could just do or not he does not need any permission and uh, this was thanks to the brilliant work and yelling and grumbling of jaypal singh and other indigenous people uh, members in the constituent assembly uh, 
In fact, Granville Austin's book has uh, a fair amount of pages on this debate. But it would make a brilliant PhD thesis to look at the safeguards available under the fifth and sixth schedules and their actual implementation in a state with a preponderant indigenous people's population, like in Chhattisgarh, which was created ostensibly to get, give greater representation to tribal peoples, or Jharkhand, which uh, publicly was given uh, the same reasoning, but is back to where we are. Uh, the, uh, the new concessions given in Chhattisgarh and uh, Orissa just completely go against the whole Vedanta judgment. But I think there is a sense of tiredness in the local lawyers, the local activists. There are few. I've seen some of the local activists fighting those battles in Odisha now as part of the farming struggle in Delhi, because they're also small farmers and are very worried about the farming laws. So they're fighting on too many fronts. This is where academia can help them supplement them and be, be available to look at the legislation available, uh, the necessary kind of uh, litigation to be put across, the necessary kind of uh, private members' bills to be introduced in parliament, which will never see the light of day, but will at least ensure discussion points. Uh, introducing motions in state assemblies, which in all probability will fail, but will force uh, the ruling and opposition parties uh, to take cognizance of the issue, to uh, go to committees uh, which are available uh, for public uh, complaints in parliament and, and put in your complaints, because many of these com committees have the uh, powers of a civil court, which allows them to summon documents and officials, and uh, which is hardly used. I used it a long time ago uh, in the Chakma Hajong case, and then collecting that information uh, through the parliamentary committees uh, from the government, which was otherwise not able, was not willing to share any information, uh, formed the basis of the final petition in the Supreme Court. Uh, which uh, Mr. Nariman argued pro bono on behalf of the NHRC. When I went to the NHRC in the complaint, uh, Justice Varma was quite happy to look at it and he said, okay, we'll take it up. You suggest the name. So I quickly went to Mr. Nariman and Mr. Nariman quite happily said yes. And uh, the rest is history, but it's not been implemented. We had a great order, but if you go to Arunachal, it is as is where is basis, and the tensions are rising uh, between the Chakmas and Hajongs and Bruges with the local indigenous Ao and other tribes. So, uh, indigenous people is not just uh, land rights, it is cultural rights, language for one, um, complete access to forests where a well-meaning wildlife activists have turfed them out of their historically uh, historic domain. But some portions of the Wildlife Act need, definitely need to be uh, revisited. It, it wasn't the tribals with, who led to the mass slaughter who were involved in the mass slaughter of, of uh, tigers and elephants. It was British colonial officers and their uh, wonderful feudal Indian friends. So uh, it's language rights, it's land rights, it's mineral rights. In fact, a major concession is available and uh, example is available in under even the weak US law. Under US law, all the mining rights of the area in the American Indian reservations belonged to the particular tribe living in that reservation. Now, this was where the Vedanta judgment was 
slowly uh, going to be building upon. I mean, it would have to be built upon in later litigation, but was definitely a very important step to that. And that litigation only happened be not because of us in India. It happened because of a wonderful group of Indian researchers working in London for Amnesty International who put in all the time and effort there and and sub and gave it to uh, people in India. They were all Indians, Indian nationals, not even people of Indian uh, origin or diaspora. But it was so very important to get this kind of research done. This is, can be done in a number of cases in Chhattisgarh presently, in the Telangana border with Chhattisgarh, in uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, in Maharashtra, where anybody doing this kind of research and you need to be very careful don't not be uh, too extra uh, enthusiastic. Do it, as they say in Hindi, fum fum rakhna, because we are resolutionary, we are not revolutionary. And uh, uh, we look at activists who have been arrested uh, in Garchurali, uh, who were just documenting information. One who was a part of the Prime Minister's internship program, fellowship program, was uh, doctoral student from TIS who's presently in detention. So uh, there's tons of areas, but you need to decide what you need to do. It's a lot of field work. That's the problem with this area. Secondary research is marginal compared to the amount of field work that you will need to do. Thank you. Thank you for patiently answering those questions. Uh, can we take a quick 10 minute open house if students yeah, yeah, have sure, questions sure. that sure. they would like to unmute them, unmute their mics and ask? Yeah, yeah, please. Any questions that you would want to directly ask uh, uh, Dr. Nair, anything that has not been covered, like I'd clubbed the last two questions and I'd asked it. If you need further clarification, then please unmute yourself and uh, you can ask the question directly. I mean, if you're feeling diffident about having got your uh, thoughts together, don't worry, you can also email me subsequently. I, I Except that don't expect a prompt reply. Give me 48 to 72 hours because sometimes I'm on the move or involved in a very serious matter which requires 16 hours of work. I pride myself on the fact that uh, my uh, facts are sacred and my uh, yelling and mumbling and grumbling comments are free. So collation of facts and organization of those facts take a lot of desperation. So give me 72 hours before you expect a reply. Uh, or I, if I don't give you a detailed reply, I will just give you uh, URLs and uh, signposts to where this information is available because I have a treasure trove of documentation which before I kick the bucket I will donate to an university at some point. Okay, it looks like we've come to the end of a very, very challenging, fascinating morning. And I think Dr. Nair, what I would really, really thank you for is that you have, you know, sometimes uh, you require a role, you know, if you you are thinking in terms of engaging with an area or with an issue, it's important for you to understand exactly what role your, your uh, research is going to play. And I think uh, that was very critical to be saying that there's a boards of material. There is There are these joining of dots kind of work which needs to be done. And only if it is done can you <coughs> expect that, you know, some kind of... Uh, movement may happen or at least you put people on the back foot and how it is important to keep doing so if you want to dislodge them and i think that kind of came through in every one of the responses that you gave and the connections that you made so thank you very very much for that i mean that was the reason why we were very keen that you come and do the human rights uh, segment for us and we're extremely grateful for the time you've taken, as well as the patience with which you have addressed each of the questions that the uh, registrants have asked. And thank you so very much. 
uh, everyone for being here. And I would sometimes say is that, you know, ponder on what um, Dr. Nair has spoken of today, because I think it is a much deeper thing than just the factor of finding an area or research, but it's to saying that, all right, if you undertake research or if you're into academics, you must also have an idea of what exactly is your place in the polity and in to what extent, if you are unhappy with things around you, to what extent somewhere you have to also own responsibility for it, you know, both for what is and for the fact that what is not. And I, I presume because uh, Dr. Nair has been such a lifetime crusader that he would necessarily be able to, you know, like has been able to tell us that this work is not just like, you know, it, uh, it requires people to put shoulder to wheel and those shoulders are needed and possibly those shoulders need to come from within the academy. Uh, thank you once again, Vasanti, for doing a very, very effective job. And so we have the last of the workshops uh, next week around the whole area of disability rights and research. So, and write in to us, write in what the whole experience was, not in this workshop, as well as the earlier ones. I think we want to continue this as a fixture. So your feedback would be of great help to us. Thank you once again, Dr. Nair. It was Thank really so a pleasure much. once again to interact with you. I wish the camera had turned on, but anyway, your voice is equally powerful. Yeah, yeah, no, no worry. <laughs> my, my mugshot is not the greatest in the world. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for all the time and the patience and uh, the warmth of the reception. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Dr. Nair.